Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar, Learning Sendero Group's Seeing Eye GPS app. It is presented today by Kim Casey, the CEO of Sendero Group. The mission of the Pennsylvania Training and Technical Assistance Network is to support the efforts and initiatives of the Bureau of Special Education and to build the capacity of local educational agencies to serve students who receive special education services. Our goal for each child is to ensure individualized education program teams begin with the general education setting with the use of supplementary aids and services before considering a more restrictive environment. Let me tell you a little bit about Sendero Group and Kim. Sendero Group is a company that is dedicated to finding accessible solutions for independent wayfinding. Kim Casey is their CEO and has close to two decades of experience at Sendero. Kim has been involved with an accessible wayfinding technology since its inception. She has presented at many industry conferences and her experience spans from testing, research and development to end user training. Okay, hello everyone, can you hear me? Yes. Great, okay, just wanted to check before I start it. Uh, it's great to be here with everyone today. Uh, today I'm gonna be talking about learning the Seeing Eye GPS app. Um, I'm gonna start off, I've got contact information here for Sendero Group, our main website, senderogroup.com. We also have one about general uh, wayfinding um, and accessible um, GPS.com. So that is, is kind of brings in all of the available options. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's up to date. <laughs> it changes daily, of course, <clears throat> almost daily. And then if anyone needs to contact me after this presentation or a lot of you contacted me regarding the Seeing Eye GPS uh, uh, instructor copy. And so if you have any questions with that, this, this email, iphone at senderogroup.com would be the best place to go. Um, another thing that I'd like to mention about those applications is that when I reply to you, a lot of my replies go into uh, your bulk or your um, junk mail. So just check for that. I try to respond right away. So if you haven't heard from me um, within a day, then check your junk mail. And I just want to let you guys know that all of the research that Sendero is currently doing um, has been um, underneath a federal grant from the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research. Um, we are currently developing indoor solutions because uh, we've been doing outdoor for quite some time and realized that uh, the search doesn't end at the door. So it'd be nice once you go inside a building to uh, be able to orient yourself once you're inside. Okay, and so I can start off talking about what is accessible GPS or wayfinding for that matter. <laughs> wayfinding is just a more general term. GPS refers to wayfinding outdoors. So as uh, BZ Benson said so many years ago, accessibility for persons with visual impairments is usually a matter of having the right information at the right time. Having information means having choices and and the ability to make the correct choice the first time. It means not having to engage in time-consuming deductive reasoning from impre imprecise clues or frequently having to ask for information or assistance. And we find this a lot um, when we have, when we're training people with GPS, a lot of times they're either not sure of themselves or they don't have all the information they need and so they will either give up or um, be highly frustrated and lost and feeling like there's there's no answer. So um, what we aim to do with our accessible GPS is provide the correct information so that people can navigate independently and confidently. So some benefits, I'll just outline them really quickly, of accessible GPS or are uh, the person can learn si about their surroundings and have access to the signage. All the print signs on streets, everything that's inaccessible normally is uh, voiced out loud and with a little bit more detail than uh, your average sighted person might need. So um, that's one thing accessible GPS is very strong with. Um, it also identifies unknown points of interest. So as you're traveling down the street, a lot of times I do this um, when I'm driving along, I don't realize there's points of interest. Um, what the accessible GPS will do is it just names them off, um, kind of like a, a sighted guide saying, hey, there's uh, the Walgreens, there's the Safeway, there's 
Um, so as you go along, you get an idea of what points of interest you're passing. Um, not necessarily stuff that you're needing for that immediate moment, but it helps you familiarize yourself with the area. Um, um, that's the look around as well. Um, street names, intersections, points of interest. Um, the GPS can help with mental mapping skills. Uh, everybody learns in different ways. So being able to hear about points of interest might help one person, whereas hearing intersections helps another. So having access to all of this information really gives people many ways to figure out their surroundings. And the last item here is to confirm their current location. A lot of times um, the most important question that, that needs to be answered is, where am I right now? And uh, so that is something that GPS can help with. It also introduces right-left concepts, cardinal directions, clock fakes directions. So it just it kind of does the repetitive. Um, if, you've, if you have a student that's not very familiar with um, 9 o'clock, 3 o'clock, that sort of thing, 12 o'clock, um, being able to use this and having it be repeated many times is, is a really easy way to drive this concept home. Um, and it also, um, we have an intersection database with the Seeing Eye GPS where the intersection will be described, uh, its shape. So a lot of times as you pull up, it's usually a 90 degree angle, but sometimes it's not. So the app will let you know that it's at two o'clock, your, your right hand turn is at two o'clock rather than three o'clock. It's kind of an angled street rather than a straight on. Um, some problem solving skills and safety issues that are um, helped by accessible GPS. They can determine distance and direction to a destination. Just having the confidence to know that information and have it update as you move is really a, a comforting piece of information. It confirms which way you're traveling and that you're traveling in the right direction. And one thing we tell a lot of our students is uh, when you're traveling, make sure that the distance to your destination is getting smaller. Um, and it, because the GPS, as, as I'll show in slides to come, sometimes can jump around depending on its accuracy. So as long as your destination is getting closer, then you're on the right path. And it also, because of the points of interest database, it can give you access to addresses and phone numbers in case you need to call someone. And of course, this is run on an iPhone. So if you don't feel like calling the business, you can call someone to come and help you out or um, this is really great. Um, when I first started GPS um, uh, 20 years ago or so, um, it was on a computer and it wasn't, I mean, it was great, but you had to have, carry an extra device. So this is all in one device. So some frequently asked questions when it comes to this application, and I've um, received some applications for the Seeing Eye GPS app on um, non-compatible devices, so hopefully I can clear that up here. Um, the supported devices are iPhone 4. Um, this we keep waiting to break um, since Apple is getting pretty good at phasing out all of their older phones. Um, but as it stands now, the iPhone 4, I, I've been testing it on an iPhone 4S and it still works. So anything uh, later than that works just great and the iPad uh, needs to have cellular service. Um, as does the iPhone. Uh, the data plan is required because um, we have all of our maps on a server instead of stored on the phone. And this saves in having to have a huge storage, a huge phone. Um, a lot of times the phones are prohibitively expensive if they have a huge um, gigabyte storage and that's what would be needed for the entire US. The app is not self-voicing. It needs voiceover. So if you are trying out the app uh, and you do have voiceover on your phone, it's best to really see what it can do is just load voiceover and it will give all of the prompts. Um, and it, it's pretty much a silent app and, and maybe not that helpful. What I like to do when I'm um, testing it and driving it around is I will just put it on, um, usually in one of my cup holders in my car, just put it on and then have it follow me around and give directions and uh, so that I can hear what's going on and that the app is actually functioning properly. And uh, if you have any students that would like to try the app before purchasing it, we have a one month trial version that they can download. It's uh, actually a 30 day to be technical, um, but they can try it out and make sure it's something that they would find useful. 
And so downloading the app, being able to find it on the App Store, uh, you just go to the regular App Store, then you select Search, and then you type in Seeing Eye, and you usually get, or Seeing Eye GPS, and you'd probably get two selections here. Um, and I'll talk a little bit, there's a little bit of difference between these two versions. They're the same application. Um, I'm not sure you guys can actually see that small writing, but they say Seeing Eye GPS and Seeing Eye GPS XT. Um, <clears throat> so then you'll select which one you want, and then uh, you just go through the regular um, iTunes process. At that point, it's out of our hands. So you follow the iTunes prompts, might need to uh, enter your password and um, confirm that you want to purchase the app, and then it'll download. So as I said before, there's two separate apps. The one um, that you guys are applying for, um, the instructor copy, is the Seeing Eye GPS XT version. So this one is a non-subscription. It doesn't time out, doesn't have a subscription. Uh, the user can purchase it for a one-time fee. This was um, created for mostly uh, rehab and VA and different government um, agencies because they do not allow uh, subscription purchases for their clients. So this is a one-time, um, one-purchase fee, and they have it for life. The Seeing Eye GPS is most popular with our um, end-user consumers where they would maybe just want to use it for a month or can't afford you know, the full price for the XT, um, they can um, free download and then they have to um, sign up for a subscription either for 30 days or for one year. And let's see, did I go? It's free to download. Okay, so if you download the subscription version, it's a little bit trickier than the XT version. There's a couple more steps. Um, so then you're going to either select new subscription or used existing subscription. And this is if you, if your client buys a new phone and wants to transfer, this can also work for um, the XT version. If it's in your, um, oh, should I be? Okay, we're going to be breaking for questions. I just saw the one about Androids. Unfortunately, the answer, the quick answer is no. <laughs> Not at this time. Um, we may actually in the next few months see where all funding is and, and see if we can't uh, develop for Android as, as well. Okay, so back to the subscription version. Um, the 30-day trial, after the 30-day trial is over, then you can purchase a one month or one year. And it's recommended to register your copy. And that is what I was saying before, so that you could switch phones. Um, if your phone is lost or broken, uh, you will still have this registered copy. Uh, the trouble with iTunes is that we don't get any control over the purchasing, so we can't actually see uh, who's purchased what. So it's the only way we know is if you register your copy. That makes it easiest. Then I can go in and I can renew uh, subscriptions and set everything straight. And at the end of the subscription, um, for a lot of people that are concerned about subscriptions automatically renewing, this one does not. So if they want their service to continue, they will have to manually go in and select um, purchase new month or year subscription. Let's see. And the app updates, as long as you have either the XT version or a valid uh, subscription version, all of the updates are included. So then all you have to do, I didn't actually provide a screenshot for this, um, but all you have to do, I'm sure you guys are used to this with your other apps. When there is an app um, update available, it'll let you know. Uh, you just go to the App Store icon, you click on the updates on the bottom right of the screen. And then uh, sometimes you have to go to the purchased link so that it'll list all of the apps that you've purchased and then just select the update button next to the Seeing Eye GPS app. These are just kind of housekeeping items that long-term users will have to run into. So how does the Seeing Eye GPS work? So uh, it works on iPhones and iPads, and it uses the iPhone's onboard location sensors, so the GPS, Wi-Fi, cellular compass, and uh, it combines that with server-based maps so that all of the United States or whatever region you're in um, can be loaded uh, as needed and based on your current location. And you also need a voiceover 
to provide location and routing information as you're going along. Um, it's really uh, a fun tool, as I've seen, you know, blind travelers feel comfortable exploring new areas. They find um, points of interest. A lot of times, I'm not sure if many of you are familiar with um, the previous CEO of Sendero Group. We started out in 1999, Mike May. Um, he used to be, at all times, my... Um, my my driving assistant. So he would tell me where to go, where we were gonna go for lunch, and un this was all due to accessible GPS. So it was really, it was a lot of fun to travel. Um, when I first started driving um, to new places, I would always think that I was lost. And Mike would always tell me, no, no, keep going. It's right up here, you know, just two more blocks, just keep going straight. And if it's not there, then we'll turn around. And sure enough, it was always there. Um, the GPS rarely lies. The maps, um, very rarely, if they're new, sometimes they're a little spotty, but most of the time they provide really great information. So, and the GPS accuracy, this was one thing I was talking about. Um, you can guarantee or pretty much count on your location being between five and 30 feet. Uh, and what I like to say is that you picture yourself inside a bubble um, with, you know, whatever your accuracy rating is radiating around you in a big circle. It's kind of like a bubble. So it's not going to get you to a doorknob or um, to an exact location, but GPS can get you between five and, and 30 feet. And then you just, um, the person will use their orientation mobility skills after that. Um, it is blocked by uh, large overhangs. So if you're in a tunnel, uh, the GPS will not be able to reach. And so you'll lose uh, satellite reception. Um, a lot of times tall buildings, if you're in downtown New York City, um, it'll create what's called the urban canyon effect where the signals can't really get through the buildings properly and they start, they might start bouncing off the buildings and it might have you a block or two away of where you actually are. So one thing we like to tell our customers if they're actually in that area and they're finding the GPS to be drifting or jumping or unreliable, is to pause at every intersection because it tends that most of the buildings clear out in that area. So the GPS can actually locate you and then you can move to your next spot. Um, and then uh, just even if you are in a good reception area, due to the nature of the satellites, um, they as they're they're moving around the, the atmosphere, they create a phenomenon called GPF, GPS drift. Uh, and so you might be sitting there still and it might tell you your destination is five feet, then it's 20 feet, then it's, uh, you know, 30 feet, and then back to five feet. So that's just the nature of the beast. So once you're there, um, really, um, we've been talking about the last, the final 50 feet uh, for I don't know how many years now. Um, but with GPS, uh, GPS cannot normally accomplish the, the last 50 feet, unless you're having a great day and GPS is right up there next to you and, and it gets you right to the door. So the map accuracy, the great thing about having them stored on a server is that as soon as they're up, updated from the map manufacturer, they're updated on our phones. Um, this is the same with the points of interest. So uh, if a new point of interest, we have two sources. We have Foursquare and um, Google points of interest. So as soon as one's added, taken away, updated, it's updated in our database as well. So that's, that's really a great thing that the maps are up to date. We have other products um, that we have had downloaded maps and we update them once a year. While they're still uh, accurate, it's there are times when a point of interest or something is closed and is no longer available or one's opened up and it's just not in the maps yet. So the great thing about having them on a server is um, that you can have up to date, instantaneous uh, maps and points of interest. If you lose cell coverage, um, the GPS cannot keep downloading the online maps and points of interest data. So all of the automatic announcements, the um, you know the kind of person on your shoulder saying, "Hey, that's over there," and um, you're passing this point of interest, will stop until you gain cell coverage again. If you have a route loaded, it'll continue to work, uh, but it won't be able to recalculate. So if you go off route, it's best just to wait until your cell coverage comes back and then um, in your cell and everything can be recalculated properly. I think the next slide, 
Yes, I'm going to pause here. Um, were there any other questions other than the Android platform? Okay, that one was answered. I think we're good to go. Does anyone have any questions? I'll pause for just a second and see if anyone wants to ask a quick question. Um, Kim, you may have covered this, but it came back in. Uh, how much is the cost per subscription? Okay, I figured that would come up. Um, right now, the 30-day is $9.99, $9.99. And the uh, one year is $69.99. And um, if you have um, clients that are um, needing discounted prices, we typically discount the one-year subscription at least once a year, sometimes twice. And that is will go down to thirty nine ninety nine. Uh, is this available in Canada? It is in Canada. Um, we have uh, another app in the UK. We have one country in South America, Argentina. Um, I think that's, that's it for that. Um, our entire list of all the countries. We have a few in Europe, and um, another Australia and New Zealand. Okay. Yeah. Um, if they install the app onto their phone and then want to transfer it to an iPad instead, is there an issue? Only if um, it's not on the same iTunes account. Okay. So yeah, it needs to be on the same iTunes account and then it, it works like any other app. Um, you can download five times on different devices depending on how many you have. Does this work indoors? In, well, we're working on it. Um, I'll go over that in just a little bit. Um, what has to happen in a lot of places? There's there's two different two different indoors um, avenues. Is one with beacons, um, and I I can go over that and just when we get to that point. And there's one using uh, the w existing Wi-Fi in the building and um, indoor maps. So um, it's only available in uh, very limited locations, but obviously Apple, Google, all the mainstream companies and um, various accessible indoors mapping companies, Boney, uh, Global with Loud Steps, Blind Square, um, all of those places are trying to get more and more. Um, part of our grant that we're doing right now is we're trying to create a centralized database. So anyone who has beacons or indoor location positioning to share, they can do so in our database. So we're hoping by the end of the grant project, we'll have that off the ground and we can offer more than, um, you know, a few 30 or so places that we currently offer. I'm hearing a very quiet voice. I think that's you. Yep, there you go. Uh, one of our participants uses this on her phone uh, regularly, and it eats up her data. How much data does it use? Oh, it depends on how much you're searching, but um, it's a constant download since um, we've actually tried to um, minimize the amount of calls to the server, but just the fact that it's as you move along, it's updating the map and it's updating the points of interest. It's like... It depends. It really depends. I can't give an exact figure of how much data it uses it, but it does use quite a bit. Okay. Um, one thing I would recommend is if uh, you don't leave it running in the background, so make sure you turn it off when you're not using it, and that won't keep the maps from updating. Excellent. Um, Kim, there's one last question which I can answer. The handouts are currently out being made accessible. They will be posted along with a recording of this webinar to the patent website. Um, if you would like a copy of these handouts before they are posted to the website, please email me, uh, Jennifer Edgar. Thank you. And that's it for our questions. Great. Well, I'll continue on here. Um, so then I'll start talking about what can seeing IGPS do? Um, it can provide look around information, street names, addresses, points of interest, and heading direction. And these uh, little tidbits of information um, will depend on the user, obviously, what they find valuable. But it's really great to have access to all of these different pieces of information as you're walking around. Uh, you can search for points of interest. You can create a turn by turn route to a point of interest, to an address, or to a predetermined location. 
We recently added, well, maybe a year ago, added waypoint routes. And this is for when you're off the map. Uh, think Hansel and Gretel breadcrumbs. Um, maybe on a college campus that isn't necessarily mapped out with Google Maps. Um, you can create your, your own points of interest. You can create your own routes, say, from the cafeteria to your dorm room or something like that. So uh, big parks, parking lots, anywhere, um, camping, hiking, anywhere there's no map, um, no street map, uh, you can create your waypoint routes to keep track of where you've been and uh, when, how you're going to get back. And then it can also do destination travel. When you load the app for the first time, and you want to make sure that you select two things. Number one is allow location services. This is pretty standard among all GPS and uh, location finding apps, and, and some actually that are not. <laughs> but you want to make sure you have yes selected for the seeing eye GPS, or it won't be able to place you on the map. And then we just have an agreement that you'll need to uh, agree to to proceed into the app. And then we'll go into the first screen. This is what is first loaded uh, when you load the app. So we'll understand the screen layout. At the top left-hand corner, there's a back button, and this will take you back to the previous screen. Obviously, when you first load the application and there's nothing to go back to, that back button will not be there. Um, but it's there so that if you get deep within menus and um, if you go from points of interest and you just want to quickly go back to location screen, you can just hit the back button. In the upper Right-hand corner, we have the look around wand, and this is something that you can turn on to make your phone kind of a direction pointing device for points of interest and intersections. Um, there's a chime when it, uh, ascending chime when you turn it on, and you can just turn it different directions, and it'll announce different bits of information. So if there's a point of interest and you're pointing it left, it'll name that one. If you turn it to your right and there's an intersection there, it'll name that off. Um, when you do change screens, that automatically turns off, so you don't have to worry about it just kind of rambling on. Um, but if you do want to turn it off in your current screen, just tap that button again, and it'll turn right off. Then the main part of the screen is the screen information. It will display current messages, options, and functions. Um, in this particular screen, it's showing the nearest address being um, actually Apple's address in Cupertino, Cupertino, California, uh, the current heading of the user. Um, and that's actually in terms of southeast, southwest, um, south, north, east, east, west. Um, the intersection ahead, if available, so it'll tell you what you're coming up on. So it'll tell you what street you're currently on. In this case, it's infinite loop. And uh, it tells you how far away you are from the intersection and what type of intersection it is. So it tells you 491 feet. It's a three-way intersection. Um, and then it tells you uh, it's behind. Uh, I'm assuming this is a T intersection. And uh, it tells you the intersecting street on the right and the left. And it also can give you the nearest point of interest. Um, this is just the main screen. If you're not doing any searching or you're not doing any routes, this is the one that comes up. And then there's also a submenu button. There's uh, more information we found uh, to be a little bit verbose. And a lot of times people weren't uh, regularly interested in that type of information. And on the second screen, I'll go over that when we get to location screen. But there's um, like your speed, your current speed, and your GPS accuracy, and a couple of other altitude. So that's what the submenu button will take you to. And along the bottom of every screen are the function buttons. And um, from left to right, they are the routes button, location button, points of interest button, map button, and settings button. And they're on the bottom of every screen, most screens. Um, some of the searching screens, they're not there. But they help you navigate from one screen or one function to another. So this, I'll keep going on this one. This is basically going more into those function buttons along the bottom. Um, they're just easy to go from, so if you're on the location screen, you want to quickly go to points of interest or you want to quickly change some settings, um, all you have to do is press one of those buttons down along the bottom. So then the rest of my presentation will go um, each button along the bottom, um, and I'll go into more detail on each of them. So if we press the location button, the second button from the left, 
uh, we would be able to hear about the nearest address, heading direction, intersection ahead, nearest point of interest. And then the submenu, like I was talking about, uh, talks about the speed, location accuracy. Sometimes it's fun to call up the speed, uh, maybe when you're bored on a, car, a long car ride and you want to know how fast the driver's going, you can pull that up. Location accuracy lets you know how well GPS is tracking you. Um, 15 feet's great. If you start getting up in the hundreds, then you need to be concerned with how accurate your information is. But I haven't seen that in quite some time. And I've been doing this since uh, selective availability was turned off in, in the late 90s, where um, the scrambling, the intentional scrambling of the US military was turned off so that we could have more accurate GPS. And the altitude, if that's something that's interesting to you. So look around mode. Um, this is just the automatic announcing as you're going along. Uh, one great feature of the app is that it'll automatically announce uh, points of interest and intersections as you're traveling along. Um, it doesn't announce all of them, obviously. It would be chattering nonstop, but it'll send out a new signal and just kind of give you that, hey, did you know that XYZ is to your right or um, this intersection's coming up? Uh, it's a good way just to, you know, get a constant reminder of what's going on around you, what's around, and just fitting all the pieces together on the map. If you find, um, if the user finds that they want information right now, you can do a hard shake of the phone and it'll announce your current location information. So a lot of times uh, people are traveling along and they just want confirmation and the app isn't giving it to them, so they'll shake the phone and it, it'll, it'll give you that information on demand. Oops, I don't need to make it any bigger. So then the next button, the third, actually the middle one, the third from the left, is the points of interest and there are multiple ways to search for a point of interest uh, you can do nearby that's just plain what's around me in a big circle tell me everything from closest to farthest and it goes out i think a few miles um, depends on the point of interest database you're using foursquare has a larger circle than the google points of interest uh, you can also search by category so maybe you're looking for a restaurant maybe you're looking for a bank maybe you know depending on what you're looking for you can narrow down your search uh, a lot of times if you just put in a name a common name you'll get way too many uh, results to be helpful so you might need to narrow it down by categories you can also enter the text of the the point of interest that you're searching for so i gave the example here of the davis public library um, you can type that in and then hit the search button and it, everything that has Davis Public Library in the name will be returned. Um, you can search your user points of interest. This is similar to the um, waypoint routes that I was talking about earlier, but these are not associated with a route. So the user points of interest are a lot of times our, our customers will save maybe their mailbox or um, a particular place that they know they're gonna come back to um, a friend's house that isn't in the commercial database. Um, you can save all of these as a user point of interest and they're not shared um, in our database. So they're only saved on your phone and you don't have to save or share your personal points of interest with everyone else. And then we have, um, we were actually at the time of making this um, PowerPoint, we had um, beacons. We were working with a company that was installing beacons in different locations. And since then, they have changed over to um, Wi-Fi signaling. They found it to be a um, little more reliable and less reliant on batteries. So we're experimenting with that at the moment. Um, and we'll see some of the places, I, you know, I should have added some slides. Some of the places that are um, mapped out are, um, the San Francisco Lighthouse, the Chicago Lighthouse, a um, couple of airports, and um, the NFB Jernigan Institute, uh, some hotels, some conference hotels. So as I said, it's limited for now. We're trying to, obviously, this is something that's kind of exploding in the mainstream market as well. So we're trying to piggyback or gain access to all of those databases so that we can provide that to our customers as well and have it accessible at the same time as accessible for sighted people. <clears throat> so uh, another, so then the third button along the bottom, we're gonna, the first button actually on the left is um, how to create a route. And when you load that page, you'll see that there's 
many ways to create a route. You can go to home. This would be a pre-saved pre -saved location. Um, you can do it to a point of interest. So say you want to go to the nearest coffee shop. That's um, You can search for that coffee shop and create a route to there. You can actually put in the street address if you have it. Uh, you can pull from your contacts database. So if you have have a friend um, in your database and you have their address, it'll make a, um, a route to their the first address you have saved for them. Uh, you can do rave point routes and you can um, do, we have a history, so it'll save all of your, 25 of your latest routes. So if you go somewhere frequently, uh, it would be just something already saved. You would just call up that exact route. If you're going from home to work, then you just pull it, that one, it's already in your history. I'm going to go a little more in depth on each of these options. So selecting a route to home um, automatically creates a route to your home. You don't have to put in the address as long as you've saved it. So if you haven't saved it, you will see uh, this pop-up screen here on, on the um, application. It will ask you, do you want to set your home address to by typing the address by your current position, um, select from contacts or cancel. So what I recommend is um, actually when you're at home, setting your home address, and you can do this in the settings, you don't have to create a route to home, um, but you can go into settings and save it as your current position and just stand in your driveway or at your front door, make sure you have a good GPS position um, and record that point. That'll be more accurate than typing in the, in the address. A lot of times um, the addresses on a street are, uh, they are uh, averaged or they're um, kind of estimated and so, what the database will have is a range of addresses. So this street is um, 9200 to 9299. And then they'll just guess what each building on that street, uh, what its address might be. So if you want an actual position, that's why I recommend just do it with the current position. Um, yep. So then you mark that. And so if that's marked, all you have to do is um, Let's see, did I put that on there? I did not. Um, if you select home, it'll just automatically create the route and it'll start on the route page. At the end of all of these, I'll show you what the route page will look like. Um, and then the second option to create a route to point of interest. So I, like I said before, you can um, search for points of interest in different ways. You can do just nearby. And in that case, if you wanna do just a nearby search, you would leave this text field empty and just select this search button, plain and simple search button. It'll return all of the points of interest that are nearby. If you have a specific, then you'd type it in here and then select the search button. Um, if you have a, a nearby point of interest in a specific category, then you'd select the category and then you'd enter in the text and hit search. Um, or if you wanna just search categories, you can just pull up the category and see what's nearby. Um, and then user point of interest, you'd select that, and then it would list out all of the user points of interest that you saved, and you would select the one you want. And then um, indoor, um, if you select that one, currently what that button will do is uh, give you this choice between either loud steps or indoors, I-N-D-O-O dot R-S app. Um, and then you can, the loud steps app at this point has more selections, like I said, some of those, the lighthouses um, and NFB and Chicago Lighthouse and uh, Chicago, there's a grocery or not a grocery store. It's called the Merchandise Mart. Um, that's where they do most of their testing. That's where they're based. So you can search which indoor building you want. Um, ideally, at the end of our uh, search, this beacons would it would be a little more seamless. So if you were going into a building that actually had beacons or it had um, indoor mapping, you would be alerted and you could just switch into that map. And, that's, and then, so if you wanted to create a route to a street address, here's the screen that would come up. So along the top, you will have, um, you select your state, uh, select your city. Uh, it's already inputted for you. So if you're um, so in this example, it shows that the person's in Sacramento. Um, it will be already populated. If that's not something that you want, then you would go ahead and um, select the X on the right hand of the box and delete it and then enter in the city that you do want. 
Um, you can put in the postal code. That sometimes speeds things up. Uh, there's a lot of places uh, where you're not really in a city that the map database isn't sure whether it's part of Sacramento or whether it's part of um, some other some other name. It's it's really interesting how sometimes there's cities here that the map doesn't recognize. So if you put in the postal code, that's usually a step around any problems you might have with the city finding. And then you enter in the street address. Um, but if if you are staying in the same city, all you have to do is enter the street address and hit done, and it'll call up. It'll give you a choice of what what um, matches that that address has made. The fourth option to create a route to contact address. Uh, here's a listing of the iPhones, different people in their phone. So you just pick on the person. Maybe I want to go see George today. I'll pick on his contact. And if he, I have an address listed with him. Actually, if he's listed in this, I do have an address listed for him. So I'll select that and I'll be routed to his house. And then the, the fifth option is a route to Waypoint. This brings up a different um, different user interface here because it's not using the maps. So you can start, it opens up, you can either record a new waypoint route or load an existing waypoint route. And these are things that if you already have one saved, maybe a favorite hiking trail um, that you can save here or you can rec record a new one. Um, another, Another option with the waypoint route, sometimes uh, users don't like the route that uh, the GPS creates or that the maps create for them. So they'll do their own waypoint route and save that instead. Like I said, these are great for you know being on a school campus or a hiking trail, a park or a campground. And Route to History uh, saves the last 25 destinations that you've created, so you can quickly go back to the same one. So if I want to go back to Foursquare Coffee here, then I can just select it out of my history list. When I select it, uh, I get the choice of either making a pedestrian route, a vehicle route, a getting warmer, or a bicycle route. I think we've taken that out. Not many people are selecting bicycle. Um, but we have different options, depending on what kind of route you want to create. Okay, so I'll take a stop now that I've gone through the basics of all of the, the buttons. Actually, I haven't, but we're going to go through, since I've covered the, the main functions of the app, I'm going to show some ex real-life examples. So I want to take a break here and see if anyone has any questions so far. Yes, Kim. Um, you mentioned that voiceover must be activated to hear the information. Would the traveler automatically hear this information or would he or she have to double click the text? I believe you just answered this when you mentioned shaking the device, but could you restate that? Yes, so if, if voiceover is loaded, it'll automatically name out things as you're going along. You don't need to tap it or anything. It can be stowed away. Um, same thing with routes. If you're in an active route, uh, it will name, it'll give you, I think, three different indications of your upcoming turn. It'll say, it'll give you quite a bit of time. So say if you're on a freeway, it'll give you time to change lanes to get off the off-ramp and um, make the turn. Um, and it, and in the, the announcements change depending on fa how fast you're going. So if you're walking, obviously the announcement's going to be a lot closer to the turn than if you're driving 50 miles an hour. So all of these things are automatically announced as long as voiceover um, there are some auditory uh, noises if you have voiceover off, but they like you'll get a ding every, every time you cross an intersection, but it won't tell you what the names are. So you'd have to at that point look at your phone, see what it is. So if you don't have voiceover, you might hear some beeps and boops, but you won't be able to hear all of the information that's currently displayed on the screen. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Another question, can personal points of interest be shared with friends or family members who also use the app? Yes, they can. Um, you can email them or I think there's, um, oh, I forget what it's called. It's the sharing. Um, let me see if I went over this. In one. Hmm. I can't remember, but yes, there's two ways to share. So you can share. Um, it is recommended to back up your point of interest 
because one will overwrite the other. So if you want to keep the one you have, um, <clears throat> well, actually, if you have a backup, it'll overwrite whatever you're copying over. So make sure that you um, back it up regularly so that you'll have a, a copy of that. Thanks. It's great to know we can share our points of interest. Um, another question. In, in um, a past experience of a participant, this app has been a battery. Um, it uses a lot of the battery. Do we still need to be concerned with having a portable battery source? Yes, unfortunately, that's one thing that we just can't get past. Um, just because it's using all of the sensors and, and the constant um, computing and that sort of thing. So it does eat up the battery. Um, and like I said, again, if you're not using it, make sure you get it out of the background. I'll show um, one of the last slides is how to make sure it's not running in the background so that you don't run down your phone's battery if you're not using it. That is all the questions that we have. Great. So it looks like we're ready to start practicing with the app. Now, um, I hope some of you have your phones with you. Um, we can do a little bit of this virtually, although the maps aren't stored on the phone, so there is no virtual exploration. But you can at least play with it um, where you are, um, go through the steps as I go through them. Um, I would like to go uh, through creating a route to a point of interest. Uh, creating a route to an address, showing you uh, the power of the waypoint route, and how to create a user point of interest. Uh, so if you can, if you want to, I'm going to kind of go slow so that you guys have a chance to go along with me. And I'm going to pause for questions. So let me make sure that I can see them as they come up and I stop. Um, is that something we can manage? Uh I can field the questions to you, or if you just want to okay. take a break, do you okay. want me to field them to you as they come up, or at I a think, break? Yes, it's as they come up, so I can see that there is a question, okay. so that I don't leave anyone behind. So I want to make sure everyone is able to follow along and, and understands where we're going with this. Okay, so the first exercise we're going to do is create a route to a point of interest. And just to reiterate, uh, like I said, when you're searching for points of interest, there's uh, many different ways to do it. The layout of the screen is basically along the top in the um, text area is a, a text box that you can input any point of interest name you want. And to the right of that is a search button. Below all of that are the different categories that you can select. And then if you do select the text box, the bottom half of the screen turns into the keyboard so that you can input the, the um, whatever point of interest you want. And uh, you can also use uh, voice Siri, uh, but just beware that in noisy situations, it doesn't really hear you clearly. And it just make sure you confirm that it is pulling up the right address or the right point of interest um, if you do use the voice. So um, we've got the nearby point of interest search. You just leave the text blank specific point of interest, which we're going to do today. And um, nearby point of interest in a specific category, you'd select the category and then put in the name. So uh, we're going to search for a Starbucks. And as you can see on the screen there in the text field, I've only input the word Starbucks. And this is because sometimes the points of interest database can be very particular. Obviously, you're not going to have a hard time finding a Starbucks. Um, even if you spell it wrong, I think you'd still end up finding some. Um, but if, if you're off by one letter, sometimes it won't return anything, and it can get pretty frustrating. So what I suggest is that you put in just the right amount of text to make a match and that you don't have hundreds of results but that you um, don't put in too much so that you narrow it down so small that it can't find any. Or if, if it was Starbucks with an apostrophe S, then it wouldn't find it. So it can be pretty particular. So then once you put in the word Starbucks, you, um, do you have any Starbucks around you? Uh, there are people from all across the state of Pennsylvania, so some will have Starbucks close by and others may not. Okay, well, if there is no Starbucks, we could probably just put in the word coffee and see what comes up, or cafe, and then hit the search button. 
So if you do a search and it doesn't find anything, it'll ask you if you want to switch points of interest sources. And if you are currently have Foursquare loaded, it'll ask you if you want to switch to Google points of interest and, and vice versa. So then once you have done your search for Starbucks or coffee or whatever you're interested in, actually, it doesn't have to be Starbucks or anything. I won't be testing at the end of this. <laughs> Okay, so say that's what I've done. And so my returning screen uh, with my search for Starbuck is quite a few, actually. I have um, pretty much one on every corner, <laughs> it feels like around here. But the one I want is a few down. So I've, um, I'm gonna select one that's about 10 miles away from me. And then, so when I select that one, the next screen that comes up is the details page. So that'll give me the location's address, a phone number if it has it, and how far away it is. And then on the bottom part of the screen, it'll give me the choice of the different routes that I can create. Or if I wanna call an Uber, I can do that. Or I can call them on the phone to make sure they're open. Or if they actually have the product that I want, um, I can call them on the phone and it'll initiate that call. Any questions so far? Um, there's one question. Uh, a participant has a Starbucks nearby, and it states that no more points of interest are available within 62 miles. OK. So does the, the Starbucks not, not come up? Yes, I believe that's what's happening. That actually just happened to me. And uh, when I was given the little box, I hit Google points of interest and then Starbucks came up. So okay, they might that want to might be the issue. Um, we have on and off problems with Foursquare. So let me just load the app and see if it's actually working at this point. Um, they did get back and said they switched to Google and it is working now. And it worked. Okay, so that's the, that's pretty much why we put in that switch to Google because of um, Foursquare sometimes will um, get overloaded and stop returning points of interest. So we don't really, we don't really wanna leave people high and dry and we give them the option to switch. It's probably in both databases. Let me just make sure it's doing the same thing. Yep, it is. So there's something going on with the Foursquare. So if you aren't on Google, you were gonna um, need to switch to Google and then it'll find the point of interest. And if you feel more comfortable, um, you can set your point of interest default to Starbucks, um, I'm sorry, to Google, so that you don't have to worry about this extra step. So if you find that the four square points of interest are always giving you trouble, then switch to Google and have that search first. And if it does, if Google doesn't find it, it'll ask if you wanna search for square. I can show you how to do that towards the end when we go through all of the settings. Okay, so basically everybody has been able to do a search and select a point of interest, find out more details about that point of interest, and then see what options are available for routing. So that's where we are with that. Um, oh, I will, um, I'll go into, on the last screen, I go into um, what the routing screen looks like. So we'll just pretend like we've created a route but then I'll go into that more detail in, in a couple of slides here. Okay, so um, we're gonna go back. We're gonna use the back button and we're gonna get out of that Starbucks because it turns out we're not really needing caffeine. We're gonna go back. Um, it'll probably take you back to the location screen. So when it does that, uh, you can select the route button on the bottom left-hand corner. And then it brings up the screen, um, create route to, and you have the choices of home, points of interest, street address, contact address, waypoint, and history. Uh, you guys probably shouldn't put in the Sacramento uh, address. <laughs> it can create it, I've done it before, um, but it may take some time. So um, if you were to do this, then you would hit um, the street address button and then it brings up the screen, create route two, and you enter in all of the street address information. 
So uh, the California and Sacramento will be pre-populated. They will already be there waiting for you. And um, if that's correct, just continue to the street field and then you'd enter in the street address. And um, same as the Starbucks before on the address, you're gonna wanna put in enough information, but not too much to be so specific that it won't be able to pull it up. So in this case, I've only put the letters S and T for street. Um, because I'm not sure if it's listed as street, S-T-R-E-E-T, -E -E or just S-T or S-T period. Sometimes that makes a difference. So um, I typically will just put in the bare minimum and see what we get from that. Um, here's the whole screen on helpful temps, tips on um, getting a, a match. A little bit more about the postal code. Um, yeah, if you have a troublesome city, then put in the postal code. If it keeps saying there's no such address, hopefully um, you have access to the postcode and you can put that in and it'll most likely find what you're looking for. Um, and then if you, of course, if you wanna change the text fields, you just have to press the X in the right-hand side of that field to delete it. Um, it on voiceover, it's a swipe uh, right, so you'll swipe to the next one. So if you're in the text box, you just do one swipe and it'll take you to that clear button. Okay, so we've just put in our address uh, to 111 I Street in Sacramento. And what will happen is it'll come up with this little dialog box here that tells me how many choices I have that match what I have searched for. So in this case, I only have one. Sometimes it will have multiple. If you have a situation where there's an East and a West Street, um, that'll come up. And then of course it gives you the postal code. That typically solves problems if you're not sure exactly if you want east, west, north. Um, you'll get multiple choices here. So then you would just select the one that you want. In this case, I will confirm that this is the correct address. And then it comes up to the next screen where you get a pop-up box to select your route type. And I can select between pedestrian, vehicular, getting warmer. Um, a little bit about the getting warmer um, before I move forward. Pedestrian vehicle are pretty self-explanatory, but the getting warmer is kind of like the um, uh, kids game where you used to play, um, there'd be something hidden and you'd have to go find it. And as you get closer to the object, the person tells you getting warmer, getting warmer, getting warmer. That's similar to the getting warmer route. Um, it, lets you know how far and what direction you are from your current destination. So it doesn't give you any street names, doesn't tell you where to turn, but it will tell you that if you're heading in the right direction to your destination, it'll say your destination is 1,000 feet straight ahead, 900 feet straight ahead, 800, 700, and so on until you get to your destination. So it's, there's no real detail to it, but if you um, basically know where you are or um, if, if you don't want to take the streets, then the getting warmer um, can get you in the vicinity. Uh, another thing is, is when you're at the end of a pedestrian or vehicle route, it'll go directly into getting warmer. And this is just to let the user know that we've gotten you as far as we can on the streets. Now it's up to you to get close to where exactly you want to be. And so you'd select one of those uh, options depending on what was, how you were planning on traveling that route. Okay, and so if I selected, I think this was a vehicle route that I selected. Um, VoiceOver will name off everything that's on this screen. It'll say, um, it'll tell you, um, this is actually the second screen uh, on the route, but it'll say, um, start out heading whatever direction you need to to get to this intersection and then turn right. So on this screen, it actually says turn left on Nancy Circle and 268 feet. And there's a big arrow for low vision um, customers. Um, and then it'll tell you destinations where it is 10 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 6 o'clock, wherever it is, west, east, north, south. Um, and how far away this uh, turn is. So it'll say in, one, in approximately one minute, you're gonna be making a left turn. And then it'll also give you your estimated time of arrival. So how long the route's gonna take you. So where I wanna go 
it's going to take me 26 minutes to get there. Um, you also have options if you want to see all of the route details, so all of the turns listed out. Uh, you can do that by hitting the route details button. You can cancel the route. So if you decided, wait a minute, that's not the, that's not where I wanted to go. You can just hit cancel there. And if you're on the route and you've maybe made a wrong turn, it'll automatically recalculate for you. But if you want it to, um, if it's not for whatever reason, uh, you can hit the recalculate route button and it'll do that for you. Sometimes if it has a funny position for you, uh, for a starting position, maybe your GPS wasn't very strong, the route will come out a little bit strange. So if you hit recalculate route right away, it'll give you a fresh route and you don't even have to make the misstep or go off route for it to recalculate. You can just do it there. If you miss anything that it said, you can hit the repeat button. And then as you go along in your route, it will automatically announce the distance and direction to your next turn. Um, depends on how fast you're going, but it's regular intervals. Um, and then when you're close to an upcoming turn, it'll give you notification that you have an upcoming turn. Um, when you're actually on the turn, uh, it vibrates and makes another um, clicking, uh, let's see, car turn signal clicking noise, just to let you know that your turn is on top of you. And if you're not turning soon, then you've missed it. Once you've made that turn, uh, it waits a little while for you to go down the correct street before it gives you confirmation that you've made the correct turn. And in between the time of an upcoming turn and the notification that you've made the correct turn, all of the automatic announcements are turned off just so that the user is not confused with um, pieces of information that aren't gonna help them on their route that might actually make them miss the turn. So if you pass, an intersection it won't be announced or if you pass a point of interest it won't be announced until you get that you've made the correct turn confirmation notice so it it's nice that the app goes silent during that time so you can focus on making the correct turn and then once all, all is well it continues with its automatic announcements and then once you've made the correct turn of course it'll tell you where you get to turn next and this will repeat until you reach your destination Let's see, I think I have a screen, I do, of the route details. So if I were to have selected the route details, it would tell me um, all of the route directions. So like I said, it would tell me to start going west on Katrina Street towards Nancy and turn left Nancy. Was there a question? Yes, there's a question. Um, how does it work if your destination is on a corner? Um, I think as you get close to it, it'll say arrive near destination. So, um, meaning it's on the corner of, so it might announce too soon. Is that what the concern was? I'm unable to elaborate unless um, Ken puts in more information. Okay. Well, I think what it'll basically get you probably to that intersection, so to that corner. And then from there, you'll have to find the driveway or whatever it is, the front door. Uh, so then it'll, it'll wherever the street address is it's marked. And this is where it gets tricky. Um, if the street address is a little bit off, it might take you further down the street or not far enough. So that's where we say the frustrating final 50 feet where you have to, uh, we've gotten you in the vicinity and then you have to use all of your other skills to get you to the front door. Great, thank you. That's it for questions. Okay, great, good question. Okay, and so here's the route details screen. Uh, a lot of times people like to hear where they're gonna go before. Some of our other products, we had an option so you could print this out in Braille and that sort of thing, but for, for the, uh, we're a little bit limited on the iPhone, um, but you can see all of your turns before you go, just so you know where you're gonna be going. And the current instruction is highlighted so that if, I know, I'm not sure you can see it on this screen, but there's a little box around. So wherever the box is, that's what's going to be announced on voiceover. Um, and then to go back to the route following screen, you're just gonna select that back button in the upper left-hand corner. And you could hit cancel to quit the route in, from this screen, or you, you can hit recalculate the route, and then it would recalculate and relist these out for you. Another question. 
Um, can this be used in conjunction with a Bluetooth refreshable Braille display? I believe so, as long as it is a uh, iPhone approved Bluetooth device. That's the only limitation we have with those. Great, thank you. All right, so, okay. So then now we've gone through a route. Um, another type of route are the waypoint routes. So what we like to paint the picture as the user or Hansel and Gretel dropping the breadcrumbs as they walk through the forest. Um, so the user would drop little so-called breadcrumbs with the app. It would mark the current position where they are and um, basically string those points together to make a route so they can retrace their steps. So all they have to do is walk the route, um, record the waypoints that they want to um, add. Some of them are added automatically and you can add different ones manually depending on what you want recorded and it'll reroute you. So all you have to do is reverse the route and it'll take you back to where you started. Uh, so to create a new route, you would uh, actually on our previous screen, you would select the waypoint button, obviously, and then it would take you to the record a new waypoint route or load existing waypoint route screen and you would select new. Um, and then you have to name it. So I could say this is the park entrance and then I'm going to hit the save button. And so then it automatically starts with waypoint one. That's park entrance that I just recorded. So that'll be my starting point. And then it'll also list all of the other waypoints that I've saved. Let me see if I have another screenshot. I do. So as you're going along, it will start adding automatically waypoints. So in this example, the first waypoints, the one I saved, waypoint two and three are ones that the app added at regular intervals. So as you get far enough away from your previous waypoint, it'll just go ahead and drop another one. And this is just so that you can keep a better route without even having to interact with the phone. And they'll be labeled with the waypoint number um, in sequential order, and you can just go through them through the list. So at one point in my route, at waypoint four, I decided I needed a better point of interest, and I wanted to specifically mark the point where the path splits. So I did that. So um, Let's see if I can, yep. So then I add, add waypoint button and then I typed in the name of the waypoint and then I hit save just to make sure that it would mark that point where it splits. You, you might wanna mark something else like a tree in the pathway or bench or anything that might make sense. Or if it's on a college campus, there's certainly all sorts of paths that meander and turn and twist and make things difficult. So you would wanna mark those. Um, by by the custom adding button and then as you see it continues to add more waypoints as i go along waypoint five waypoint six and waypoint seven i specifically wanted to record because it was the bench at the end of my path so then that's my waypoint route so uh, actually i didn't go over the shake the phone um, option. So say you don't want to interact with the phone, but you do want to mark a point. If you shake the phone, it'll automatically add a point and the nearest address will be added to the waypoint if it's available. Obviously, if you're in the middle of a park, it, there isn't going to be one or it'll just give you the address of the park. Um, but you can mark a point there. And then when you go back, you can um, change what it says when you have more time to type and that sort of thing. So then when you're done, you select the back button just to close and save the route, and you will have that route as you need it. Questions? So then here we are, we, we've saved our route. We wanna load it. Instead of creating a new one, we're gonna load it. Then we're gonna, so it, uh, it displays all of the routes that I've created. The only one here is park entrance to bench at the end of the path. And so I can select that one and it'll automatically start uh, the route. Depending on where I am, if I'm at the bench or if I'm at the park entrance, it will give me directions from the appropriate location to the, so it'll assume if I'm at the end, I wanna go to the start. And if I'm at the start, I wanna go to the end. Hopefully that makes sense. 
that's waypoints and this is you know just when you want to get customized when you have your own space that's not in the commercial maps and another area where you will want to get customized is the user points of interest so with the combination of Foursquare and Google, we have tons of points of interest, but of course there's ones that you're going to want to create, and those are the ones that you will do with the user point of interest. So if you load here on the bottom, it's kind of overlaid, but you'll see on the screen on the bottom, the point of interest button here is highlighted. And so that means you're on the point of interest screen, and you will just select user points of interest. And, and then it'll bring up a list of all your personalized points of interest. So I have actually some interesting ones here. I have the start of the green belt of the campus. Um, UC Davis has green belts running all over it. Um, I have the campus library, the um, cafeteria near my dorm room, the dorms. Um, then I also put in a, uh, an entrance, a specific entrance to a point of interest because a lot of times the points of interest in the database will be to the street address, and that's not enough information, kind of similar to the previous question that, uh, I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he asked if, if the point of interest is on a corner. Um, this is where I could create a user point of interest, actually at the front door of that location, and from then on, make routes to that place so that I wouldn't have the difficulty of figuring out, oh yeah, this building, it's on the corner, but if I go 20 feet this way and 15 feet back into the building this way, then I might find the front door. So uh, you can use user points of interest for that as well, more detail on the commercial points of interest. And then of course I marked my mailbox just so I could get back to it. Are there any questions? Uh, yes. In the past, Sendero has provided GPS software for the HumanWare Braille Note that used a portable GPS receiver paired to the Braille Note with Bluetooth. With the current Braille Note Touch being an Android-based device, is there work going on at Sendero with creating another GPS for the Touch in the future as it sounds like this Seeing Eye app is only iOS-based? That's correct. Um, we would love to have um, unlimited funding for all of these things. The, the Android porting of all the um, Braille devices kind of took us by surprise, but I'm hoping to secure funding for that and so that we can develop. I just can't make any definite statement on whether or not we can develop for Android. Um, and it's my understanding that the Braille Note Touch and I believe the Polaris from HEMS also runs Android. And so if it is in the Google Store, then it can be run on those devices. So I guess my best answer is stay tuned and uh, keep your fingers crossed for us. <laughs> Great. Thanks for that information. Um, that was our only question. Oh, OK. Great. So I'm, I'm hoping that everyone's getting these concepts. It's, you know, it's pretty typical for um, GPS programs. They're all uh, pretty much similar. Um, let's see. And the other thing I wanted to say about the user points of interest, they're not automatically shared, but you can choose to share them. There's a uh, share point of interest button at the top. I think I go over that in the next screen, but just in case I don't, um, along the title bar, you have the back button, then the title of the screen, the user points of interest. And right next to that is the plus sign. And so that is your add points of interest. And then next to that is your share button. So then that's what you would hit. And then it would give you selections uh, how to share, how you best want to share your points of interest. Oh, and I did. So when here's adding, that's the plus sign. So if, if you open up your app and you haven't saved any user points of interest, this is what your screen's going to look like. It's a big blank area with, in the middle, it says no user points of interest, POIs, hopefully. And then, so if you select the plus button, you get a, you fill in the name. So like I said, I could do front door um, dormitory just so that I know exactly where it is. Then there's different categories that you can choose. So I've selected user, but you can have it grouped in with the other categories. So entertainment, food, travel, those sorts of things from the mainstream categories. And you can also tag it. 
And these are just even more specific details for that points of interest. Um, the example here shown is Dormain. Um, you can go and arrow through. If you guys are on that screen, you can take a second now to scroll through all of the options. Um, like you mentioned, the Braille Note software that we had GPS running on, we had all sorts of different categories and subcategories and tags and things so that people could find their points of interest because our database was growing at just amazing rates. People were sharing their points of interest. I think we're up to almost half a million points of interest now of just people sharing what they've gone out and recorded for us. Go ahead. Uh, can you use your microphone button on your phone to add a point of interest or do you need to type it in? Um, like I said, you can use um, the Siri, the dictate, but it's not a either it's prone to accidents if you're in a noisy environment it might not hear you correctly and put in the wrong thing so if you want to make sure that it's it's spelled correctly then I would use a keyboard but if not then um, go ahead and use the dictate great thank you and then uh, just to save it you'd hit the save button and then it would be saved in your list Okay, any questions so far? Because I'm just going to go through the rest of the screens, um, the ones that we haven't touched. We've gone over the route screen, the location screen, and the points of interest screen. And I was going to go over the maps and settings screen next. So if anyone has any questions about what we've previously covered, I'd be happy to field them or I'll keep on going. If anyone has any questions out there, uh, please type it in into the question box. You may need an arrow to uh, bring that box open and, and make sure it's pointing down that arrow. No questions so far, but if any come up, I'll let you know. Okay, sounds great. All right, so we'll move on. Um, I have the map screen next. Uh, this is actually just a visual representation of a map. Um, this is mostly for um, O&M instructors or sighted people or low vision. Um, it is not accessible for voiceover, so you can't actually touch places on the map and uh, find out what the street is. That's what we have the location screen for. Um, this is this is only image. That's the trouble with with all of these maps is that they're not accessible for any sort of voiceover or text translation. They're just images, so we struggle with that. Um, Kim, we do have a question that came in. Has okay. anyone created a tutorial or lesson plan format for teaching others, students or consumers, for this app? Um, well, I was hoping to do somewhat of that with this presentation. Um, it's available for download on the Sendero website. I think you're providing it as well at the end of this. Um, but we did have the Braille Note training, and I assume that's uh, what they're asking about. So nothing quite as in-depth as that. Um, but this kind of goes tries to go through all of the different screens and how to teach them. And, and a lot of this app is taught you know obviously with the feet on the street or um, I think the best option for teaching GPS for first-time users is take them in a car kind of in a, an enclosed situation where you will be showing okay put them in charge of inputting the address that you want to go to or them doing the search and then you guys head out and follow the route and find out what happened and um, I find that's usually the best way to teach this app um, but this PowerPoint tries to go through all of the screens and all of the functions as best uh, as possible. Great, that's great information. I especially like that tip about starting out in a car. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's actually a lot of fun, especially when you get somebody who hasn't had any access to this sort of information and they have the power at their fingertips to do an actual search and to tell you where to go. It's, it's a lot of fun for people who are just learning this kind of stuff. So when it's 10 below, we can still have an O&M lesson, guys. <laughs> exactly, as long as the roads are open. <laughs> 
That was our only question. Okay, I'll continue on. So here's, uh, I think I was finished with the map screen. It's not too exciting, but uh, some people do like to see the map, so we included that. And then we have our settings, and this is really, you won't have to um, go into this too much unless you find that your particular client or um, student has a need for more information or less information or, uh, you know, a different, different announcing of different things. So um, this is where you'll go to customize the app for somebody who needs it. So we have first, um, the first option is background operation. And this is what I was talking about. So if the user needs to answer a phone call, the app will stay loaded. And the say, if you're in the middle of a route, you can answer your phone, um, finish your phone call, and then go back to your route. Um, it will also interrupt if you're on the phone. It'll say you have an upcoming turn so that you can make sure that you make that turn properly. Uh, that's what background operation is good for. It's uh, on by default, but if you find uh, that you don't really need it in the background, the person that you're working with isn't going to be using it um, and multitasking, or they typically leave it on and then go to class, and by the time they get out of class, their phone's totally drained of battery, uh, so it's turning into more of a, a pain for them than it is being helpful, then you can switch it off here. Um, there's a general settings option. There's routing settings. Um, the general settings allow you to customize your user preferences. I'll go into each screen here in a second. Um, routing settings can uh, customize the user experience in a route, so you can tell it how often you want to hear things, how far away from something you want to be before it announces, um, what types of roads you want to use or not use. Um, I'll, I'll go to that screen in just a bit. The look around settings um, lets you know or lets you customize what's announced and how and when it's announced. Um, and these are the automatic announcements, so the street names and the points of interest, different things that you're going to want to hear or not hear. So you can set them there. The About settings contains your version number and support information. And the subscription setting button, um, all of you that have downloaded the Seeing Eye um, Instructor version will not have a subscription button. Um, this is for only the Seeing Eye GPS version, subscription version. So the, the difference in product name is Seeing Eye GPS and Seeing Eye GPS XT. So the XT version will not have the subscription button. So if I were to select general settings, you'll see here that I have uh, the option to change the units that my app is announced. We have some international customers and they prefer meters to feet and yards. So we have um, that option. You can pick between feet, meters and yards. This is where you'd go to set your home address. And in this particular case, the phone does not have a home address stored. So in the edit box, it says not set. So then if I wanted to go ahead and set it, I would just go ahead and click the or select the button that says set. And then it would ask me if I want to put in an address, go from contacts or use my current position. And then this is the case where if I was in my front yard um, by my front door, I would say use current position. And then I would have the most accurate home address stored in my phone. Um, then here's where you can also change POI source from Foursquare to Google. And shake, this is the um, shaking the phone for information. So if you're um, on the location screen and you want to hear something, you shake the phone. Uh, we have some users that um, were finding that if they put the phone in their pocket and started walking, it would keep triggering the shake function. And so we give the option of turning it off, having a medium. Uh, it's a very vigorous shake, I think, at any setting, but there was enough customers where it was in their pocket, it was going off. Um, so we have a medium setting and a, a hard setting. So it means you have to really shake the phone if you want to get information, if you have it on the hard setting. And then we have low vision settings. Um, you can do black on white, white on black, and yellow on black, depending on the person's preferences. And then if you select the routing settings, you have the option to customize 
um, the auto repeat on and off. Default is obviously on, so all um, announcements are automatically repeated. You can have vibration alerts on and off. Like I said, when you're coming up on a turn, your phone will actually vibrate. So a lot of times if people have it in their pocket um, and the phone vibrates, that's kind of like a, or you know, you're carrying on a conversation with somebody in the car and your turn's coming up and you're so involved in the conversation that you've forgotten that you're actually the one navigating, the phone will kind of shake you into, hey, here, listen to me, I've got something to tell you. So you can, that's on by default, but if you really don't like vibration, you can turn it off there. If you find um, you're on a route and you have a problem, um, say something just went totally haywire and you can't figure out what went wrong and you're pretty sure it was a bug in the software, we don't really get a whole lot of these, but um, the person can send their route log and we can troubleshoot from there. So that's the best way that we have. If something goes wrong, that um, if you're in a route, we can see what happened. We can actually follow you on the route and find out maybe why things weren't repeating or why you were routed the way you were. Um, that's the best way if you have a, a route problem. I think there was a question. Yes. Um, when the phone is in your pocket, how accurate is the directionality of the app? It would seem that if the phone is oriented downwards, the direction of travel may be different. That's the thing. So if you're moving, um, this kind of the basic GPS principle, if you're moving, it tracks your motion. So it wouldn't matter how the phone is in your pocket. It could be upside down, sideways. It will track your movement. So that's another thing with GPS accuracy. You have to move in a constant direction before it um, tracks you properly. Um, so yeah, a lot of times it doesn't matter which way the phone's planted. But if you're stationary, then of course the di directionality is a little more um, sensitive, but it would still, um, the GPS would announce your last tracked movement. So if you stopped and turned around, then yes, your directions might be incorrect, might be 180 degrees off. Um, so that's something to remember um, when you're teaching someone the app, that if they suddenly stop and turn around, the app might not be telling them the correct direction. So they have to keep in mind where they were moving when they last, um, which direction they were heading when they had stopped. Um, so if uh, someone wanted to head to a two o'clock direction, it would still head the correct way. Right. Yes. As long as they haven't done any crazy turning and stopping and that sort of thing. Excellent. Great question. Um, mm -hmm. That was the last one I have so far. Okay, great. I'll keep going. Um, so then the next uh, routing setting that you can change is your arrival distance. Um, sometimes people are faster travelers or slower travelers and they find that the app doesn't announce soon enough for them to actually make a decision and make the turn. So this is where you can change your um, distance. So we have 50 feet, 75 feet or 100 feet. Um, and the default works for most, but we give the option if you want it to be bigger, say you feel like it's not giving you enough time, then you can set it out to 75 or 100 feet. Then you can select um, what you might want to avoid. If you don't want to take any toll roads, you can select that. Or if you don't want to get on the freeway, you can select that. Um, obviously, if you select the pedestrian route, it will not like route you onto the freeway. So you don't have to worry about that for pedestrian routes. That's mainly why we have those two options. Um, because pedestrian routes, you can go anyway on a one-way street and you can't go on the freeway whereas if you're taking a car you can you can only go one way on a one-way street and you can get on the freeway so that's the difference between those two um, selections so if but if there's something specific that you want to avoid like toll roads and highways then you can select it here and then uh, because people like to hear their information in different ways we have three different options um, of how, your heel, your, how you will hear about your points of interest. So we have clock face and left right directions. Clock face only, so you'd only hear um, point of interest 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock. Um, and only right left. So if you're not into the clock face, then it'll tell you ahead, behind, right, and left. And that's if anyone has any preferences, they can change it there. Kim, I have another question. Okay. What happens if you have a walkway that goes over a highway and you are using it in pedestrian mode? 
You know, I don't know if that would be part of the routes. I think if you, that would be a case where you would use the, the uh, waypoint routes because the streets won't route you on a walkway. So you'd want to, um, it may have it in the database that that's a safe crossing and then they might calculate it that way. But if you find that it does not calculate it that way, then um, you can definitely create a waypoint route to, to include that, that overpass. Excellent, thank you. All right, so those are the route settings. The look around settings that you can customize are uh, the intersection level. We have it default, it's simple. Uh, we find full is, is really descriptive um, and too much, a little bit complicated. Sometimes it'll have um, the not so well known version of the street name and so it's actually more confusing. But I believe, I want to say in Australia, it has to be on full. So that's why we have that in there. Um, a lot of times the street names don't quite match up with what people are used to calling it. But in uh, the US, simple works just fine. Um, the look around update interval. One thing if you want to save on battery or data is that you can crank this up to 60 seconds. Um, and that basically means that it will only send out a search request every 60 seconds rather than every 15 seconds. So you won't hear about as much, but it also won't be using as much as your data. And then um, in the next section in the look around configuration, you can actually turn that off if you want look around announcements to just be turned off so that you don't have to use the data or the battery or anything for it. Um, it's automatic or by default it's set to under 15 miles per hour for points of interest and for intersections it's set to under 40 miles per hour and that means uh, as long as your car or um, obviously pedestrians always going to be under those speeds um, but as long as the car is going underneath that speed otherwise if you're going say 50 miles per hour you might be passing so many points of interest and so many intersections that the app would be constantly chattering. And that just really isn't helpful for a lot of people. Um, and it won't have time to say the full announcement. So you, it would be tripping up over itself if you had too much going on. But you can set it to be off. So never announce under 15. I think there's another speed option and um, always and that would mean no matter how fast you're going it's always going to announce so you can change that configuration there and the look around um, wand the button on the right hand side of the title at the top um, that you switch on and off you can include intersections in your look around wand or not depending on how much information you want um, I, I think i'll just quickly with the look around wand is where you can take your phone and make it kind of like a pointing device as you know, you point your phone in one direction, it tells you everything that's in that direction. Kim, another question. Mm -hmm. As an iOS-based app, is there any future integration of points of interest or breadcrumbs to be camera or photo-based, similar to the Recognizer app? Hmm, that's a great question. Not, um, not at this time, but I will certainly put that on our wish list. And that's our last question so far. Okay. Uh, the about settings, we're getting to the really interesting part of this app. <laughs> uh, we have the version number. This is actually an old version. We're currently at version 3.2, I believe, or 3. Point, yeah, 3.2.3, .3, I believe. Um, and then you have access to the online manual. Uh, the Seeing Eye, uh, they were the sponsors for this app so many years ago when we first released. So we um, have a link to their website so you can find out more about them and also a link to our privacy information. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't share, collect, or store any information about our users and their actions um, and then except for the information that's necessary to run the app while you're using it. So, so we don't really have, we don't have databases for any, inf pulling any information from users. And subscription settings, uh, if you go to the, if you do have the Seeing Eye GPS app subscription version, you'll have this button. Um, the screen will read, um, it'll tell you when your app will expire or when your subscription expires. 
in the exact to the exact second. Um, and then it'll give you the option. There's two buttons. You can either extend for one year for $69.99, like I said uh, at the beginning of this talk, or extend for one month, and that's $9.99. And then it also tells you your subscription has been saved using the email address. And I used uh, iPhone at sendarogroup.com. So um, a lot of times people will contact me and say, I have a subscription. I'm not sure what email address is subscribed. Um, can you look up my how, how much longer I have? Well, this uh, subscription screen kind of saves that. So as long as they can get to the subscription screen, they can tell when it's going to expire and what email they use to uh, register for it. And then here's the little bit on closing, making sure, oh, I think oh, there's a phone, or yes. a question. Um, once you own the app, will all updates to the app be unlimited? Yes, yes, so the XT version, anytime there's a update, um, it's already included. You just have to go to the um, app downloads. Okay, no more questions at this time. Okay. Great, so and like I said, um, if it's running, the Seeing Eye GPS app is designed to run in the background. Um, so you can switch tasks, put the phone on sleep. Um, you can actually, yeah, that helps save battery. So a lot of times you can just put it to sleep and it'll still announce your location announcements and that sort of thing. Um, but if you want it to be, if you're finished using it, it's definitely you wanna close it so it doesn't run down your battery or your data. So you're going to double press the home button. I think the iPhone uh, 10 is different. So um, I actually don't have one. So hopefully somebody on the call can um, advise us how to um, do the app switcher for that particular. But you double press the home button, and you get a listing of all the open apps. And you're going to want to swipe up on the Seeing Eye GPS app tile. So if it's not closed properly, you'll see a, a blue notification across the top of your phone letting you know that it's still in use. It's usually like a blinking, uh, really kind of an obvious, hey, this is still running in the background. Make sure that you want this here or else close it. Kim, speaking of the iPhone 10 or XT, um, is there a difference in price for this version? No, no, it's all the same. Yeah, so when it, when the iPhone X was released, we just made sure that um, our software was compatible with it and the screen sizing and that sort of thing. So it's it's all the same download. Great, no more questions right now. Okay. All right, so I think I'm mostly done. So a few tips and reminders when using Sing GPS. It does not replace basic O&M skills, obviously. Um, the sing signal strength is low. If the signal strength is low, causing poor accuracy, uh, or the phone battery is run out, the user will need to rely on their O&M skills. So it's not um, a replacement for anything. You still need to be fully um, involved with your environment, make sure you're paying attention to all the cues um, and using common sense. Um, heading information is most accurate when you're moving in a consistent direction. This goes back to the question about the GPS or how the phone is oriented in your pocket. Um, if less confident travelers tend to stop frequently and do kind of strange turns, so in this case we always tell those people make sure you're walking in a consistent direction before you give it time to position you make sure that you've given it plenty of space to find you and instead of just stopping and turning and you know going different directions assuming you're going the wrong way just pick one direction and go until you're sure you are either on the right path or the wrong path because it'll it'll update as they continue to move in a consistent direction and uh, the phone battery um, I went over that a little bit. It does drain significantly. There's a whole lot going on when the GPS app, app is active. Um, I think uh, if you don't have a backup battery, I would say bring a charger with you and try to charge it wherever you are. Or if you're going to be in the car, see if you can plug it into the, the car system and charge it. Um, and then the last thing is regarding the searching and putting in text for points of interest or an address. Um, just that you put in the bare minimum of text 
And uh, so I give an example here of if I'm searching for Mel's flower shop, um, I would just, if I could, if you type in Mel's flower shop fully, M-E-L-S apostrophe S flower shop, um, and it returns no results, try searching for Mel only. Um, you might come up with things like Melanie and um, different things, but at least if you're getting no results, definitely make it less specific because the POI database can be very specific sometimes. Okay, we um, have two questions. A clarification of the price for the XT version. Um, they were specifically asking about the non-subscription version. And that's great. I did not go over that. So the price for the non-subscription version is $199. And will that change with the iPhone X XT? Or will that be no. the same? Okay. Yeah, our prices stay the same. We just, we have to keep scrambling as they keep uh, releasing new iPhones to make sure that ours is still compatible with the latest and greatest. Great. So, yeah, if anyone out there has <laughs> the latest and greatest, uh, it's usually like uh, a month or so that we can we can bug test and make sure that everything's compatible and makes make sure it works and then release. But we try to keep as close to their releases as as possible. Sure. Another question, is there any benefit or any way to pair the iOS device to one of the older satellite receivers we use to use, maybe to decrease battery drain? You know, um, that is possible, but it does not really show a huge gain in battery life. So it still uses quite a bit. And the GPS receiver that's in the iPhone is actually very accurate. So um, we just we we typically it is possible but we don't really recommend it it doesn't it doesn't make that big of a difference for all the extra hassle of having to carry around um, a gps receiver that you have to make sure is charged or has a valid battery and all that other stuff that comes with picking up more pieces of hardware great um, another question, in the next few years, what is Sendero's potential planning to integrate into this app or maybe your wish list? So if people want to come back and make sure they're tuning in every once in a while, if they're not using oh. it actively. Well, um, we're mainly working on the indoors right now um, and the, the combined database. So I think that in itself will be years on end. Um, <laughs> As it has been really since oh, maybe the last 10 years, we've been ho somewhat hopeful with all the new technology out there, maybe even less than that. Um, but so the indoors will be is our main focus. Um, we're going to be doing some testing just to find out the best way um, to present the information um, indoors. I know Wayfinder, if anyone's familiar with them, they're trying to write up a standard or they have written up a standard. So um, we're working with them as well to make sure that the standard is, is appropriate and um, that it's well adopted and that sort of thing. As far as uh, GPS, um, yeah, I, I, is there if there's anything specific, that would be great. I could put it on our wish list. Um, a question following up about beacons. Is it mostly Bluetooth beacons for indoors that you're using or pursuing? Yes. That's correct. So it's the, the one way um, a lot of businesses, I think Macy's for a while there had a lot of their um, or maybe just one of their um, storefronts outfitted with beacons. So the idea behind it is um, you put a Bluetooth beacon. It's usually battery powered. Um, you can either install it into the wall or stick it on the wall with some sort of adhesive um, in important points throughout the building. And that would be able to provide kind of a getting warmer map, not really, um, you wouldn't be able to do step-by-step -step routes, <clears throat> but um, it does give you points of interest. So it can help you get from, say, the checkout counter to the sports apparel, or um, so that's the idea behind the beacons. The trouble in practice uh, is that the data needs to be updated constantly and uh, the batteries need to be checked and, and monitored to make sure they're still functioning properly. So it's it's a great uh, great way if you, I, I, I did some testing at the San Francisco Lighthouse and it would tell me, you know, what 
rooms I was passing and how far away if I set a des destination. So it worked similarly. I'm not sure if anyone's been around as long as Sendero, but um, we had, when we first started on the Braille note, we actually didn't have access to maps. All we could do were points of interest. So our routes were um, bird's eye view. So it would tell you your, your destination is 12 o'clock, um, 600 feet. And then if you got to a place where you needed to turn, it would go um, from six or 12 o'clock to three or nine o'clock. And so you you'd navigate that way. There weren't actual street instructions. So that's kind of how the Bluetooth beacons work in practice. Excellent. Here is another two-part question. Do you have any good resources for getting cheaper beacons? Also, is there a way for us to contribute to Sendero's indoor database? There is. Um, I'll answer the second question first. Um, can I type it into the chat? Yes, I'll copy it in for you. Okay. The answer has to be in the question box, not the chat box, because oh, you always okay. won't see the chat box. Uh, that's why I wasn't seeing any of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't in the right place. I'm not finding the question box. Okay. Um, uh, let's see here. Let me see if I can find it. It's probably under attendance in the dashboard. Okay. Mm. I'm only seeing the organizers in the attendance area. Oh, Let's that's because see. I only have you as a panelist. Hold on just a second, guys, and okay. I will um, change you over to an organizer, and then you should be able to see it. I think while she's doing that, I can um, tell you a little bit about our project, our shared database project. mainstream um, location, indoor location company. They had a database for their Locate app um, where their users could go around and store beacons where they encountered them. Uh, um, so we've actually partnered with them and they've um, created a basically a same mirror database of what they already had and they've given it to us. They're calling it Ningo, N-I-N-G-O, kind of like bingo, B-I-N-G-O. Um, oh, here we are with the questions. Um, and uh, um, what you can do now, it's kind of a rough website. Um, obviously, the programmer is still working on it. Um, but you can add beacons. You need to have the identification numbers of that beacon. And then it helps if you have the name, so what you want to call it. And then um, that's that would go in the metadata. So that's that's a funny name for descriptive data. Okay, now I'm trying to find the question. It's the very last one asking about cheaper. Oh, there it is. In okay. The database. Okay. If you right. write into the second box and then hit send to all. Okay. The second box is not allowing for uh, any sort of input. Click on the question and it'll Oh, okay. <laughs> Got it. Okay, there we are. Okay, and actually, I'm gonna have to look up that website, the exact address, because it's not one that um, easily runs off. Um, but one good website to check out for what we're working on for grants and such um, is wayfinding.org. That's one I did not include on this um, presentation. But that is where you can find out everything that we're doing on our indoor project. Did that come through? It did, yes. Okay. And then after this um, presentation, I will um, look up that and I'll email it to you so you can email it to all the participants when you send the uh, presentation. Yes. So everyone, if you would like that information, please email me. Um, as there's not an easy way to email everyone at once. Okay. Are there any more questions? I think the first part of that other question was, um, is there a source for cheaper beacons? And I actually don't have, I think um, our current Supplier, um, we work a lot with Boney Global and Loudsteps, and they have um, they have their own suppliers. I'm not quite sure who they use, um, 
Oh, trying to remember. Yeah, I can look into that as well. So if, if you want to, I can email that along with the sharing database. That would be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And just to let everyone know, um, the information I was talking about, uh, different boxes like attendance and and different things like that, polls, dashboards, that's behind the scenes for those of us who are kind of managing the webinar. So you guys are getting a little inside look here with that conversation. But don't, you don't need to worry about that or look for those things. Um, we're getting some feedback here. Just thank you. What a great presentation um, and a couple thanks here. Oh, great. Thank you all for coming out and listening. I um, really would, I, I know it, it helps if it's not a, a mystery app to use. So I'm happy to do this for you guys. We are happy to have you. Everyone give Kim a round of applause wherever you are. And Kim, I hope you can virtually <laughs> hear them.